Good morning, everybody. Um, how do I follow such a beautiful voice when all I can sing you is Zig Zig R or some kind of Spice Girls song? Um, but anyway, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for asking me back. I had a good laugh with you two years ago. Hopefully, we'll have a, a good laugh today. And um, it's such a fascinating conference. I wish I could have come yesterday. So many brilliant speakers and um, so many important things for us to talk about um, at, on such a big platform as the SSAT offers us, um, particularly given some of the direction that education policy is going in um, in this country at the moment. Um, this time, I'm not talking about technology. Um, I talked about technology last time because I did a review, the Byron Review, in 2008, and then its follow-up in 2010. But this time, I'm just talking more about children and young people and about how we can enable them empower them to show and realise their unlimited potential, something I think we're not very good at doing. Um, and when I say we, I mean we as a society, not you as teachers or, or myself in my profession. I am, um, by training, um, an academic and a clinician in child and adolescent mental health, which I have to say my children find hilarious. Um, I have... Uh, my daughter is 17, I was extremely young when I had her. Um, thank you for laughing. Um, <laughs> and my son is 15. And um, when Lily and, you know, Lily and Jack were just chatting, what are you doing, Mum? Where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to talk to loads of clever people, la, 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 Liverpool, thing, thing, draw, 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 about kids and potential and empowering. And they just roll their eyes and do that, oh, my God, sort of face. Um, and find it hilarious that I, their mother, has some kind of respect for understanding young people. And I think I find it quite hilarious too, actually. Um, I'm very good with other people's children, not so great with my own. Um, when my son was very young, um, and I was doing a series called Little Angels and then House of Tiny Tearaways, so I was doing quite a lot of stuff on the BBC, so people were looking to me as the parenting expert. Um, he was prone to tantrums, enormous tantrums. My husband is an actor, I blame his genes. Um, and I remember once being in a very public shopping centre with one of my best friends and her two small children and my two small children when Jack decided just to throw a major one. And it was one of those ones where actually you look at that child and you just look at the parent and think, control your child. Um, but so people were looking at me and looking at my child and then looking at me and then looking at me and I realised to my horror they were recognising that I was somebody who professed to understand how to manage children with behaviour problems. So my friend looked at me and said, darling, put your head down, walk away, I'll pretend he's mine. <laughs> Isn't she great? Such a good friend. Um, so there you go. It's, uh, it's great when you're talking about other people's kids. It's such a beautiful challenge when you're dealing with your own. But um, I wouldn't have it any other way. And, uh, and yeah, so that's it. But what it, what's really interesting for me, um, having teenagers and also working with teenagers, is what a bloody awful time they get of it, really. And I, 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 I kind of... I don't feel sorry for them because I think there's a lot of excellent stuff about life for them now and I'm frankly quite jealous about a lot of what they are able to do, technology, the way technology is giving them the most unbelievable opportunities for learning and thinking, creating, communicating, commenting and yes it doesn't always happen in the best way and yes we are still trying to understand how to use social media to communicate and yes it is really inappropriate when nasty, when nasty rumours are spread about people such as we've seen recently with Lord McAlpine. But these are things that we have to flush out and understand and learn to manage better. We have to be very careful not to regulate them. But I think when I talk about young people, um, I think it's very important to set a context for, for what I want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, there is a phrase of febophobia, it means hatred of youth, and I think it's an interesting one because it sets a context for, I think, then how we manage, nurture, grow, educate and develop young people in a culture that actually, I don't think, respects them very much. For example, the Age Discrimination Act um, only begins to be um, enforceable from the age of 18, for example. Now, I'm going to read you some quotes. It's, uh, it's a bit of a kind of... Uh, 
shout out if you can. Uh, tell me who you think said these things. This is the first one. What is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders, they disobey their parents, they ignore the law. They riot in the streets inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? Later. Who? Later. Oh, you smart ass! it is. <laughs> I wanted somebody to say, I don't know, Michael Gove or something. Um, yes, it's Plato, Mr. Showoff in the front row over there. Um, okay, see if you can get this one then. Um, okay, so that was the 4th century BC. Congratulations, you've just won yourself a complimentary something, which I'll give you later. The world is passing through troublous times. The young people of today think of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They are impatient of all restraint. They talk as if they knew everything, and what passes for wisdom with us is foolishness with them. As for the girls, they are forward, immodest, and unladylike in speech, behavior, and dress. You can't speak. OK, who's that then? OK, you can speak. You're the only person who read classics. <laughs> Oh, okay. Peter the Hermit. Yes, that well-known person. Peter the Hermit preached this in uh, 1274. I just struggle to understand how Peter the Hermit knew that girls were forward, immodest, and unladylike in speech, behaviour, and dress. But hey-ho, maybe being a hermit in those days was very different. And there are many, many more I can read you. But quite frankly, we've always hated young people. We've always felt challenged by them. And partly because we envy them. Because just as our young people are becoming exciting and interesting and challenging, we're beginning to realise we're just becoming boring old farts. And so it is quite a threatening and interesting dynamic that's going on. But um, so here we have um, a negative mindset, I think, a culture where we fear young people. Um, we also, I think, are raising children and young people in what I would call a risk-averse culture. Now, just to um, illustrate this, I want you all to think about your favourite place to play as a child, if you can get that far back in your mind. Got it? OK, if it was outdoors, put your hand up. All right, that's everyone and the people in the wings, OK? And if it was away from the direct supervision of adults, put your hand up. Aha, there you go. See how old we all are. Now, if I had a group of children and young people here, would I get the same overwhelming response? Pardon? No, I wouldn't, and I think that is a real shame. Children aren't allowed to climb trees in schools. Some schools have banned the playing of conkers. In other schools, children have to wear goggles if they play conkers. Snowballs aren't allowed to be thrown anymore in case there is a bit of grit in them, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, how are we supposed to develop and empower young people to unleash their potential to become the next generation of brilliant thinkers, of entrepreneurs, if we don't allow them to take risks. Can someone help me understand that? Risk-taking is a developmental imperative. It's something that we all must do. It's the only thing we can do in order to learn how to keep ourselves safe while also challenging ourselves in our lives. But children and young people are being denied opportunities to take risk. I mean, how often do you see kids playing out, like I used to play, like many of you used to play? We are raising children in captivity. We do not have free-range children anymore. And I think, then, if you stick that alongside what I seem to be worried about that's happening in education via education policy, which is an increasing lack of relevance in terms of what children are asked to learn and they're also asked to then reproduce, I am feeling rather concerned about the fact that we're not doing a very good job to empower the children and young people who are our future. As my daughter and her friends said to me the other day, you know what, you left us with a load of debt that we've got to earn a lot of money to pay for. You won't be in an old people's home because there won't be any, because there won't be any state provision for it. We're going to have to wipe your bums and feed you and get us out of debt. Thank you very much. Um, Shame on us, and they're right. So what am I talking about here? I suppose what I'm talking about is EQ, emotional intelligence, which is something I think that sits around a lot of the theming um, of the speakers that you've heard um, during this conference, and I wanted to talk about it a little bit more. 
It's something I'm thinking quite a lot about at the moment because I've been asked to advise the government in China on setting up mental health services for Chinese children and young people. Over there, they have a crisis in terms of an increase in depression and anxiety and suicide, particularly um, uh, amongst 15 to 24 year olds, where suicide is the number one killer uh, of, of that age group. And being a culture which is not help seeking, it is a stigma and a stain on the family name to um, acknowledge that there are difficulties. Most young people are desperate and despairing and end up killing themselves. And it's very interesting then, working in China, which has an interesting education system where there's a lot of rote learning and there's a lot of building of IQ as measured by targets and testing. So children who come out with terribly good results, but actually have no idea how to apply their thinking or how to apply their learning in, in a real world way. And then often are struggling to manage stress, don't know how to emotionally regulate, and so become deeply, deeply unhappy. When you look at the uh, issue of EQ, and for those of you who are interested, I'd, I'd point you to the writing of the psychologist Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, um, and also particularly if you're interested in exploring this issue in relation to schools and pedagogy, look at castle.org, uh, C-A-S-E-L, um, and that's um, uh, where Goldman and others have put a lot of these issues together to think about the concept of social and emotional learning as it relates to children and young people and schools. What we know is that IQ fundamentally accounts for only about 25% of the variance when you look at uh, many predictors of life success, which would be performance, career, relationships, and so on. And I think there are some really interesting examples um, to, to illustrate this um, very strongly. You will have read recently that Sir John Gurdon won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology. He is the genius who first began to think about um, uh, cloning and his early work now has led to huge amounts of innovation in terms of cloning and stem cell research. What's really interesting about this incredibly modest man who still works as an academic at Oxford University is that when he was at Eton, he was ranked at the bottom of his entire school year in terms of science. And his uh, school report, which he has beautifully framed and hanging on uh, his wall at his office uh, at Oxford University, said that it was laughable that he had any aspiration to be a scientist. He had no idea about how to learn the facts as they were presented to him, would only always question what was being taught, and seemed to want to do experiments in his own way. <laughs> well, they were wrong. Um, he is a genius. Um, I'm also thinking about Richard Branson, who left school with very few qualifications. Steve Jobs, who dropped out of university. And uh, Lord Putnam, who left school, took five O-levels, left school with three. Alan Sugar, who left uh, education at 16 to sell car aerials. Now, I'm not saying they, these people have a low IQ, but I'm saying IQ as measured by school success clearly wasn't what was ranking at the top of their profiles. So what made them successful? And just to put a woman among the mix, um, I will uh, rather arrogantly talk about myself. I went to a very academic girls' school where my parents were told I'd never be a high flyer. And when I was made a professor in 2008, my mother wrote a letter back to the school which fundamentally sounded like that. Um, so there you go. And rock on my mother. Um, and actually, it's because I have a mother like that and had a, a truly inspirational father that I was able to overcome um, quite a massive insecurity about not really knowing how to do well at school to suddenly find a subject I was passionate about and want to do everything I could to learn. I was very lucky to be able to do that. But that was also at a time when we were allowed to make mistakes. I remember in my science lessons, we were allowed to blow up the laboratory. We were allowed to singe each other's eyebrows off. Now most young people have to watch the teacher do the experiment behind a large piece of perspex for fear of um, issues relating to health and safety litigation. Um, again, this really worries me. Where is the excitement? Where is the relevance? Where is the inspiration? Where is the motivation? And where is the risk? And actually, where is the fear? 
Reflect on your own careers. And if, if I were to ask you all to tell me your biggest and most important learning experience, I suspect for most, if not all of you, it would be a time when you made a mistake. You made a mistake, you took a risk, you pushed yourself and you challenged yourself, and coming out of that, what happened was that you really were able to push on, learn and develop yourself. But nowadays in my clinics, I see young men and women who are so afraid of making mistakes, who have such a fear of failure, um, they, who don't under, can understand how to construct failure as part of learning, as part of development, as part of thinking, that they're carving into their arms, they're starving themselves, they're trying to hang themselves or they're taking overdoses. And let me tell you, these aren't your stereotypic uh, children and young people with psychological and emotional and behavioural problems. These are kids who come from good backgrounds. These are kids where life has been fairly enriched for, for them since the beginning. But the messages that they are taking on board, and particularly through, uh, for some of them, through the education system that they sit in, is if you fail, you are not good enough, you cannot fail. And then how do they build resilience? And so it is no surprise that uh, clinicians like me are being asked increasingly by educators, by professionals such as yourselves, to, to collaborate and help you think about why so many young people in your classrooms, in your colleges and lecture theatres are presenting with emotional and psychological difficulties. It's not because they don't have IQ. Many teachers and head teachers, friends of mine and colleagues will say they have the most extraordinary young people who frustrate them immensely because they have unlimited potential, but the young person feels blocked. And as an educator, there is a confusion and a concern about how to get past that block. So what do we do? Well, we need to challenge, I think, much of educational policy as it's moving forward. I am concerned that we are taking such a nostalgic, retrospective look at what used to work once in the past, that we're forgetting that we're dealing with a new, vibrant generation of children and young people who actually need support to think in the way that they think, which, quite frankly, is very different to the way that we think. I was watching my daughter, she just went through her GCSEs and um, I was just looking at some of the work she was doing for some of the controlled assessment work and it was fascinating. She was doing projects with kids around the world. One night she and a number of kids in other countries went into the Smithsonian Library to have a look at a, a document. I used to go to East Barnet Library and get some book that some kid had wiped their nose on and it, I mean, you know, you can't compare the exhilaration of learning that I think young people today have the opportunity to do but yet we don't seem to want to innovate with them and around their thinking. I love Eric Mazur. I wish I'd met him. He's flown out as I flew in, which is a real shame. I love the idea of flipped learning. It's genius. It's so simple. It's so obvious. It's genius. It's an absolute genius thing. And I understand he did an exercise with all of you and who's very interactive and, and it was very successful. Kids know a lot. What we think education is, or what we're told to think education is, is a process by which we force information into children and young people and then get them to regurgitate those facts. I remember my daughter and I trying to learn um, the equation for momentum and having a really interesting conversation about why she needed to know it and how relevant it would be. And we were talking about thinking and how important it is to think and to learn and, and those sorts of things. But when I looked at how she'd been taught it, I realised it was so irrelevant to her life. She had no emotional connection to it. She actually didn't want to know, and I didn't blame her. Now, Henry Ford said, um, and I'd love to be able to um, have this nailed across the entrance to the Department for Education. Henry Ford said, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably the reason why so few engage in it. Um, and um, I think um, it might be useful also just to um, think on um, Gandhi's words, which I also like, which I looked up and Googled and prepared, especially for you all today, which was beautifully simple when he said, those who know how to think need no teachers. 
And I think that's what Eric Mazur is saying. I think he's talking about flipped learning as being facilitating and guiding a process of self-directed inquiry that is innate to all children and young people. And they do it in their different ways. So you will all know children have different learning styles. We have auditory learners, visual learners, and we have kinesthetic learners. And by giving the children the opportunity to go and self-direct their thinking before the facts are given to them, you give each child the opportunity to make their thinking and questioning bespoke to their own way of understanding which means then all children will engage because those who find it difficult to sit still and listen to stuff can begin the process of inquiry by jumping around their bedroom um, uh, searching or podcasting or whatever it is they need to do to become really engaged and inspired by whatever topic it is that they are being asked to think about. What I'm talking about here in terms of emotional intelligence is higher order thinking. I'm talking about metacognition. I'm talking about the ability to think about thinking. You will all be um, familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, so I won't, um, I won't go through it. But actually, it's a very useful taxonomy to go back to when we, when we think about the difference between lower order thinking and higher order thinking. And my concern is that most of education policy is so focused on lower order thinking that it's very difficult to think about how to enable children to develop metacognitive skills when they are under so much pressure to reproduce information in order to get grades which somehow they are told will um, demarcate them in terms of life success because it will enable them to decide where they go on to in the future. I think grading of exams is the least useful way of evaluating success moving forward in life. Clinically, I'm worried. And I know that many of you in schools are worried too. In an average class of 30 children, at least 20% of them will have mental health problems which would need um, to be treated. You will have a number of children facing a number of other challenges which would all get in the way of their thinking and their learning. And I think, really, if we are going to uh, challenge a lot of the prevailing uh, policy that's being driven in a direction that I think moves away from emotional intelligence, we need to work together as educators, as academics, as clinicians, um, as parents, as grandparents, and actually really challenge what it is we want our children to develop in life. Do we want them to have the best exam results? Do, do we want them to be the best people they can be? And how do we see those two correlating in a positive way? For those of you coming to my workshop, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about the brain, because fundamentally what I'm talking about here is the prefrontal cortex. This is the area that you guys work with and I work with specifically when we're dealing with children and their emotional intelligence and also their IQ, because the prefrontal cortex, the bit behind the eyes, is the HQ of the brain. It's the bit of the brain that makes us a sophisticated species, and it has a number of incredible functions, which includes the ability to think and plan, rational decision-making, logic, the ability to differentiate between fantasy and reality. But it's also the seat of our, um, some of our very key emotional regulation skills. So we know, for example, this is the least well-developed part of the brain at birth because little children often do things that are very embarrassing because they haven't quite learned how to uh, emotionally regulate, as I told you with my son earlier in the shopping centre with my dear friend who adopted him. Um, and also, they don't know how sometimes to keep themselves safe. They cannot differentiate between fantasy and reality, so we have stair gates and locks on cupboards. And when we look at little children and prefrontal cortex functioning, we also see that little boys struggle even more than little girls. Little girls tend to develop social skills quicker, they tend to develop language quicker, and that's generally because uh, social skill development is very contingent on language development, which is why we see females moving ahead um, in that way. And I just thought you'd be interested to know, this is one of those fun facts to throw into a boring dinner party, why do you think there is a developmental delay between boys and girls? How do we explain that? I'll give you a big cue, uh, clue. It's to do with the fact that you men have nipples. Now, that's got you, hasn't it? Why do you have nipples? 
I mean, obviously, don't share overly why you think you have nipples. Not interested in that. I'm just talking anatomically, you have no need for them. The reason you have them is for the first six weeks of a developing embryo's existence, um, the Y chromosome hasn't kicked in, and so we all start off as female. Ha! Um, <laughs> that's one in the eye for the anti-feminist lobby. Um, so um, you have nipples before you then develop testicles. Um, there you go. Now, what's really interesting about that, therefore, is it gives us an understanding of little boy and little girl development, which helps us understand why little boys struggle in highly feminised uh, nursery environments, often particularly little boys who are kinesthetic learners because they need to move and sitting still can often be very difficult. These are explanations that we all need to understand and share and think about. But as we look at prefrontal cortex development, what we also find is that there is another massive change in prefrontal cortex functioning, and that is a around the teenage years, where prefrontal cortex functioning dips as puberty kicks in. So teenagers behave like toddlers with hormones and risk taking becomes critical around that time of life because developmentally, the imperative is something called individuation. You have to start developing your own identity, which means clashing and challenging the authority that has been built around you in order to build your own ethical, moral, and personality frameworks. And so we have this really interesting period of time in the early years and also in the sort of uh, early secondary years going into GCS, GCSE years where you see the brain going through some major changes. Now, for those of you who are interested in that, I'm going to talk a bit more, uh, more about that in my workshop. But just what I want to end on is this. What we all do, I think, is really important. I think working with children and young people, whether it's through education or mental health or clinical well-being or whatever it is, is kind of where it's at. They are our future. And I feel very privileged to have a job that allows me to get very up close and personal with young people and enable them to unleash their unlimited potential, particularly those who have huge amounts of potential but have no self-belief. EQ is really what we need to be pushing hard on. Children who believe in themselves will learn. Even if they don't know, they will have the confidence to want to find out and to want to understand. They will feel able to challenge themselves and take risks. They will understand how important it is to work as part of a team and have skills of empathy and leadership. And these are the young people that we need for our future. And yes, it's important to do as well as you can in exams. But if that is our primary focus and that is what we're telling children is what they really need to be focusing on as they develop through the most exciting years of our lives, I think we're all doing them a massive disservice. Thank you very much.